I'm here with Gerald Swanson. Gerald, nice to meet you. Thank you. you uh, nice to be here. Give me a little information about uh, uh, who you are in this whole process of the, uh, the SNA Symposium. Well, um, my grandfather, Lloyd Ingram, uh, came to Niles in about 1913. And he started directing silent pictures in about 1912 and somehow got here. I don't know all the details of that, but uh, uh, he acted in some movies here. Uh, one of them was called the uh, Bronco Billy Guardian. And that was a film which he played in along with Bronco Billy. Uh, this photograph here is a picture of Bronco Billy Anderson. And this is um, uh, Bronco Billy Guardian, the movie I just referred to. And next to him is Lloyd Ingram, and next to him is uh, Carl Stockdale, and this is my Aunt Lois, who is seven years old. Wow. So, uh, it's a fabulous picture. To Gerald Swanstrom. Gerald, are you close by? Hopefully, come on up. Gerald was a, as the grandson of the, the actor-director Lloyd Ingram, and uh, I want to just talk to him for a second. Come on up, Gerald. Gerald Swanstrom. Gerald, now I know you're a local, local guy living right here in the Bay Area. Hey, that's bright, isn't it? Yeah, it's really bright up here. <laughs> I'm getting used to it. My eyes will be like that in the morning. Uh, but you live just close by across... Uh, Walnut Creek. Walnut Creek, right? Oh, well, that's better. Hey. Orange, I like that. <laughs> uh, so I, I met you of what, a year ago tonight... Really? Yes, that's right. Well, almost first time. the first time we met a year ago tonight, mm -hmm. and we've kept in contact over the, over this time, and we're starting to put the pieces back together. And I'm, I'm hoping you can give us a little uh, bit of that tonight. Mm -hmm. I know you got a program for us. Why don't you jump I right into it? I have a short little spiel I want to give. And, okay. Uh, me... I am the grandson of uh, Lloyd Ingram. Uh, Lloyd Ingram was a director actor here in SNA and um, I want to go through a little chronicle of his life because it's very interesting. Um, he was born circa about 1885 and he was in road shows in the circus around the country and he was a man that had a way with words. Um, as a little boy I was really privileged, and I'm going to say something to people here that have kids and you're growing into the 60s or on up in years. I was very privileged to have, to go and sit in his living room and listen to him talk about all his background and his history. And I was a kid, you know, eight years old, 10, 14, that, and my grandmother would chime in. She was also an actress, a very fine one. And I say, Grandpa, why don't you write these things down? And, you know, we'd beg him to do it, and he'd write letters, but he never really got down to the many, many things that happened to him in his career. And um, socially, he was very attracted to people, and they were attracted to him, and he was able to tell stories and to chime in with uh, who they were and what they were and what they did. And he was interested in that. And he was one that could split infinitives to put in descriptive oaths, His acting career uh, started in 1912, and most probably at SNA. He was in the Los Angeles area uh, doing some uh, little acting there on the stage, and he went out to a studio there to learn how, how to do film directing. And he directed primarily melodramas and featuring heroines and later robust comedies and westerns, and at the same time played character roles. He met and married Maudie Monroe Ingram in 1905, July of 1905. Maudie was a direct descendant of William Monroe, brother of James Monroe, fifth president of the United States and author of the Monroe Doctrine. So that's impressive, and she is impressive. She also acted and was very impressed too, and she acted in some of the movies that he made. The George Eastman House in New York made an historic film search 
uh, of the 1920s in the fall of 1956. These dates may not mean anything to you, but you may connect it because of reference. And Lloyd Chance was his nickname. Ingram first appeared as, quote, the heavy for Thomas Ricketts in, unit, in, in a unit uh, making Nestor films in August of 1912. I quote a letter here that a Mr. George Pratt of that company said, uh, he said, we are developing a sketch of your life and we know that you've been involved with Reliance, Majestic, SNA, Fine Arts, and American, and have done charity castles, her country's call, Peggy leads the way, a daughter of Joan, the eyes of Julie Deep. And Thomas Ince's, what's your husband doing? Mary's ankle, and let's be fashionable. That's just to rattle off a few in the 20s. Uh, GM Bronco Billy Anderson asked him to come to SNA in 1912. And he directed several films at SNA during his three years here. Um, he acted and I believe directed in uh, with the, the film uh, uh, Bronco Billy's Guardian um, with Carl Stockdale and Bronco Billy Anderson and Lois Ingram, his daughter, who was then seven years old. My mother, Zella, also acted in parts then and later and um, they all lived on the lot, I believe probably in one of these bungalows that's there. Uh, Lloyd directed The Fox Woman, starring Lillian Gish and Sable Lorca, The Missing Link in 1915. I'm not sure whether these were SNA, but he, he worked in and out of here. Uh, he worked alongside Charlie Chaplin at the same time in 1915. And you know, he mentioned to me many times that Charlie Chaplin had a high-pitched voice doesn't mean anything, but he was a slight guy, but uh, I don't know how many people have heard him talk. Um, Lloyd directed Hoodoo Ann in 1916, which is maybe here, maybe not, with Mae Marsh, Robert Heron, and Mildred Harris, who became Charlie Chaplin's first wife. Uh, the one thing I can say that has not been said during these two film festivals that I really like to say right now then you did not have sound. Now, to tell a story visually is difficult. Yes, a picture is worth a thousand words, but to tell a story visually without any sound requires a special kind of talent, a special kind of treatment, and he had that. Um, in those days, they had to do large gestures, or they had to move very slowly, or they had to do something to make the point without looking absurd. And some silence were absurd, but others were great. Of course, the tramp is one example. Um, 1916 Photoplay magazine, they quoted him as this. You probably quote, you remember the Fox Woman and the Sable Lorca. Lloyd Ingram was the directing genius, a stock actor and director of wide experience. Ingram entered the pictures early in the game with more or less success uh, with the Griffith forces. He is now regularly required, uh, or, excuse me, is regarded as one of the best on the lot and has been especially successful with the plays in which Bobby Heron and Mae Marsh are featured. He is quiet and unassuming and is easily mistaken for a stagehand. Uh, the information that I get are from letters, uh, memorabilia, photographs, and just remembering what I learned from them. Um, the Snakeville comedies have been mentioned here tonight. Uh, he, done, he did some s a successful series taking place in the Mythical Village and the Alkali Ike comedies. He played the part of a judge in Intolerance in 1916. He, um, uh, that was the time when he joined the Griffith Forces and uh, some other films that he directed were Child of the Paris Streets, May Marsh, Growing Up with uh, uh, Delbert Hopper, I think, uh, Mary's Ankle with Douglas Fairbanks, American Aristocracy with Douglas Fairbanks, and Lillian Gish, and Charity Castle with Mary Miles Minter. 
but he later moved on into Hollywood where he worked with Jesse Lasky and Adolf Zucker and Louis B. Mayer. In those days, it was not that difficult if you did anything at all well. You probably could get a job. Um, later during the Hollywood years, he worked, um, well, he, he, he worked and acted in a lot of films. Um, and his career ended, his, his directing career ended in 1926 when sound came in. But he continued to act in films for 24 more years until he re totally retired. His last acting role was in a film called Savage Horde in 1956, starring Fred Allen. Uh, some of the later films were westerns written by his son-in-law, who is looked up there as Ken Gamut, and he wrote pro prolifically for Randolph Scott films. And by the way, Randolph Scott's films, very few of them have been released. You see some of them, but the body of them, of those westerns, are still held tightly and probably will be in his estate, or is in his estate, I guess. He made over 87 feature pictures, and I think there were even more than that, probably over 100. Well, time took its toll after smoking and drinking for many years. It was very fashionable to do that, smoking. He um, died peacefully at the Motion Picture Country House Hospital in Woodland Hills, California, a facility you might know established by the late Gene Herschelt. And it was a wonderful hospital because in the motion picture business, many people ran out of money or didn't have any money at the end of their careers or in the middle. And they did contribute heavily to that hospital, which has some of the finest health care you can get in the world. And there, if the actors could go for nothing, if they qualified. And he went there and was cared for the last days. He was an enormously gregarious and talented. And according to Maudie, uh, he wanted to really be remembered as a man who saw the essence of a person's spirit. That's the way she put it. He wanted to make a contribution, and he did. Jerry Swanson, grandson of Lloyd Ingraham, actor, director. Jerry, thank you so much.